Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I'll take silence as yes. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Brent Lindquist. I'm the Deputy Provost. And I'm here to welcome you to a unique Provost Lecture celebrating the inaugural, inaugural award of the Rolf Medal for accomplishment in morphometrics. It's my privilege today to introduce Professor James Rolf, a SUNY Distinguished Professor and the John S. Toll Professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Jim received his PhD from the University of Kansas some time ago. <laughs> Except for a brief period at UC Santa Barbara, his distinguished career has been centered at Stony Brook, a career devoted to the application of multivariate statistical methods to a range of problems in ecology and evolution. Most notably, and the subject of our gathering today, Jim helped pioneer geometric morphometrics, the study of the statistics of shape. Jim has published 150 articles and co-authored co -authored or co-edited 14 books, and I understand a latest edition is just out recently. He has a long history of service, both to the profession, his profession, and to the university. Among his honors, Jim is a fellow of the American Academy of Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. On the occasion of Jim's 70th birthday, the Rolf Medal was created, both in recognition of his pioneering work and to honor individuals who have advanced the field. It is my pleasure on the occasion of this, his 75th birthday, to welcome Jim to the stage and have him introduce the first recipient of the Rolf Medal. Jim? I'll first give a little background about Fred, and then I'll say why it is he's, um, oh, another visitor. Uh, why it is that he's <laughs> receiving this award. Um, at just 19, Fred received his Bachelor of Science degree with high honors in mathematics at the University of Michigan, received a Master of Arts degree in sociology at Harvard University, and then returned to Michigan for a PhD in statistics and zoology. He's currently a professor of morphometrics at University of Vienna, which is a unique title, a professor, first and only professor of morphometrics. He's also a professor of statistics at University of Washington. Um, in the past, he's been scientific director of the fetal alcohol and drug unit, and you'll probably see something in his talk about fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, he also was a senior distinguished research scientist at the Institute of Gerontology and the Department of Biostatistics at University of Michigan. Um, the Rolf Medal was established to recognize some individual's body of work in the field of morphometrics. The purpose of it was to, the reason we have a medal was to create some more visibility and interest in the field and that people kind of like competition, so we have a competition and a winner. The reason that he's the first awardee is he's, I consider, an intellectual giant, made a central contribution to the development of the theory of modern morphometric methods. He's made groundbreaking innovations in the theoretical development of geometric morphometrics, and his body of work makes him the clear uh, choice for this award. I was almost afraid that nobody might apply because they would sort of recognize in the field he's the obvious winner. And so why try to compete against Fred? Um, he's authored or produced more than 300 books, chapters, articles, and videos on various aspects of morphometric uh, methods and the more general areas such as numerical inference in the sciences. He is also co-developer of two software packages called EdgeWarp and EdgeWarp 3D, which I know you'll see in his talk. Um, his innovations have also been applied across many fields, evolutionary and developmental biology, paleontology, computer vision, medical imaging, cognitive neuroimaging, 
And using geometric morphometric methods, he's also provided expert opinions in 40, 40 criminal judgment procedures involving undiagnosed fetal alcohol damage to the brain. And maybe Fred come up now, I'll present the medal. Which arrive, I got it at noon today. Fortunately, <laughs> You probably won't wear this during the talk. It's, it's <laughs> heavy. <laughs> so. I think that'll be secure. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. And Fred will be talking on biology and mathematical imagination, a purposely odd word. The meaning of morphometrics. Um, could you take this off? It's going to hit my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm. Um, well, thank you. But leave it here. Don't, don't go off. Right thank you. Don't forget. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I won't need this. Let's go back to my slides. I am honored to be here, and um, happy birthday, Jim. This is very nice. So, um, I'm not standing up here alone. I'm grateful to dozens of people over the last 30, 35 years I've been working in this area. Stephen Jay Gould, the geographer Waldo Tobler, Charles Oxnard, Richard Raymond, the late Leslie Marcus, Conti Mardia, and of course, Jim Rolfe, uh, to whom this talk is dedicated. I couldn't be doing this without 20 years of unfailingly patient software support from Bill Green, the developer of EdgeWorp, the program I'm mostly using. And there's been funds from the Institute for Humanities, University of Michigan, University of Vienna, National Science Foundation of Austria, the Marie Curie program of the, universe, of the European Union, and uh, the usual suspects from the American funding establishment. The take home message is a pun, uh, as Jim hinted. It's not biology and mathematical imagination, like it says in the poster. It's biology and mathematical image innation. Images are a special kind of data for which I'm arguing that our methods of analysis, our methods of perception of analyses, are far older than any other form of numerical science. They date back at least to the Renaissance and possibly farther. I'm going to try to persuade you of all of that today. The basic construction is to put a, percept a perceptible object between two forms, like these two mid-sagittal sections of skulls. And it's the form in the middle. That's the relatively new scientific icon, a description of change of form. Um, and I hope to persuade you that with some practice, you can read this figure, certainly easier than a table of numbers. You can discern its components. You can find its parts and you can report it competently as the core of a scientific study. This is itself the core of geometric morphometrics. The reason you can do this is that you can already read figures like this, grids attached to forms. And I'm going to suggest that we've been able to do this for millennia. People have been thinking about morphometrics <laughs> for a long time. This is a 5,000-year-old cycladic figure. Um, and they've been thinking about grids nearly as long. This is the cover of the April 2011 Scientific American. Uh, that's the Big Bang over there at the lower left. Little dot, and you see the grid indicating the expansion of the universe by a factor of 10 to the 20th or so. And then these irregularly represented surface, the grid here, indicating something about the heterogeneity of the universe. There's a flat grid here at the background in the picture that I do not understand the scientific meaning of at all. But the Scientific American editors assumed this can be understood, that an expanding grid is one of the perceptions that goes directly to the reader. Other classic examples include Charles Oxnard's from 1973 about how the scapula varies across the anthropoids. This is a craniolateral twist. Those are his words, and yes, that's what it looks like. From Sokol's book with Peter Sneath of almost 50 years ago now, an example of a grid on um, 
early evolution of early mammals, early, sorry, early vertebrates, using a grid to depict a simulation of neuralation in embryology. This is from Anton Jacobson and Richard Gordon, 1976. Going further backward, Darcy Thompson and these actually rather badly drawn classic icons in which the points don't line up with the grids. The points don't, the grids don't do what the points say they should for fish or for, hum, or for anthropoids. Albrecht Durer, 400 years before that, using grids to indicate his understanding of the variation of human proportion in a book of that name. Uh, here's a picture of one of his guides to the artist showing how the physical grid was actually used as part of Renaissance perspective. That's a guide to severe foreshortening in art in which the artist reduces the grid in the vertical plane to the same grid in the horizontal plane. And then going finally a long way back to the cave paintings, prehistoric, Paleolithic art like Lascaux, where there might actually be a grid. Um, I don't know if this is part of the original art or vandalism, but it's a surprise to find it there in those images. <laughs> the point isn't about the grid back then. The point is about the representation of variability, simplicity, and the essential aspects of form as the origins of biometrics, of which our aspects of comparison are going to be one aspect. We have representations of multiple humans and multiple animals on walls like this, or this from the cave of Altamira in Spain. Those are buffalo. Or these, um, I think they're lions, uh, from the cave of Chauvet. And a retrieval under Google of cave paintings of animals will always bring them up in multiples this way. I want to talk about one form in particular, which seems to me to be, to be the anticipation of our field by 30,000 years, well, 25,000 years. The Venus of Willendorf, about 100 miles out of Vienna, uh, is not primarily a representation of a single form. It's a representation of a comparison of forms, the average to a fertile, fecund woman, exaggerated. And it is the exaggeration that is read implicitly in this form and the others I'll be showing you, and that will be made explicit as the core of modern morphometrics, the core of geometric morphometrics. So my claim is that cognitively, we're using the same skills that recognize this as an exaggeration, as a caricature. Here's one of her cousins. This is from Le Pug, and another from Dolny Vestonitsa. All exaggerations of what is a dimension of normal variability correlated with something important. Recognition, it will turn out to be the case in caricature, or fecundity for females that need to feed offspring. There are so many images of that Venus on Google that you can actually reconstruct it in 3D from Google. Look at all of those views of the same little object. It's only four inches tall from 10 centimeters from the Natural History Museum of Vienna. Let's now jump forward um, to the invention of pictorial art um, on paper. These are clearly caricatures, a page from Leonardo da Vinci. Um, the word caricature is Italian, but means essentially conveyor of meaning, conveyor of content. So, We've changed the meaning of the word, but these are mostly impossible faces drawn as extensions of normal faces that are intended in the modern parlance as dimensions of shape space that we're going to be retrieving for more scientific purposes. Forward another 300 years, Honoré Daumier drew hundreds of these and made a living at them. This is the king of France at the time who could not be represented. It was illegal. but. Um, everyone knew that his face was kind of pear-shaped. Again, these are impossible faces. They wouldn't function. They couldn't chew. But they are recognizable as caricatures of individuals. And we will use this for extension of other kinds of dimensions that are informative. Here's a politician of whom nothing can be retrieved on Google except the existence of this caricature. 
and the corresponding sculpture. This was first in 3D, reduced to two. Or the legislative belly, my favorite. Uh, these people are really quite wide, as you can see from their spacing in this um, etching. This art of caricature by extension of individuation extends right up to the present day. I found this caricature first on the web, that's Walter Matthau, the American actor, and I stumbled across what I think is the original photograph up here in the inset. Uh, it's the same pose, same tie, same hairstyle, but Matthau's individual characteristics have been exaggerated here. Or um, someone probably known to you, Someone who certainly wasn't known to me, but I would be able to recognize him if I saw him on the street. And then someone who I very much hope is known to you, um, as in the form of Louis XVIII. You can do this, as I say, because you've been doing it since the Stone Age. What is needed is to convert it into a scientific tool. And for that, we need to explore some of the variants of what is required of the icon, to communicate visually, and then what is required of the icon if it communicates scientific content. One thing that turns out not to be necessary is the actual starting graph paper. You can do this with hexagons uh, or triangles instead of graph paper. This is a representation of curvilinear perspective using hexagons from a book about exactly that. This is work by one of my teachers, Waldo Tobler, that uses hexagons because they are less directional than rectangular grids in order to represent the uneven population of the United States. Um, a technique that Tobler called pycnophilactic interpolation, one of the worst coinages of a word in the history of statistical method. We think geometric morphometrics is actually a much more friendly phrase. You can put rectangular coordinate systems on things that aren't paper, like this confocal quartic system on an ellipsoid, um, and the system of, of uh, circular curves on a bagel, uh, either a properly made one or this somewhat badly baked one, which is actually a figure from 19th century geometry, a set of surfaces studied by James Clerk Maxwell, the physicist. They're called the cyclides. You can have rectangular coordinates that handle the existence of biological foci. Uh, three as over here, does that project? Yes, it does. Or four as over here. Um, you can do lots of things with coordinate grids besides ordinary graph paper. And these are using, to a great extent, and we will see much more of this later, your facility for 3D processing. The grids work best when they look like surfaces. Um, this one is clearly dented in. Uh, this is a picture from a textbook on gravity. Uh, this one is gorgeous because it also has an additional feature we'll be focusing on near the end of this talk, the crease where a surface lies entirely along the edge of regression, the visual horizon. And producing these clarifies the perception of surfaces enormously to the extent you wouldn't need this shadowing. But Indeed, when these are real surfaces, you recognize them immediately. This is a press pressing down on something that used to be flat. And you can see immediately that it's curved. Um, here is just the replication of that over multiple, um, in this case, tie downs. You can tell the difference between that. Let me get this out of the way. You can tell the difference between that which is a real surface, and a picture that is, in this case, only a reflected surface, a, a peculiarly beautiful one. Um, this could be a real surface, this could not, where the reflections are being managed. And you know this difference without being a morphometrician. This is a real surface. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it is. It might be some sort of herbarium. And this one, I genuinely can't tell. Probably you can't either. Yes, it projects in good detail. And this is, in a sense, the point. We, are, we can process artificial renderings of artificial surfaces as if they were real, including the flat surfaces from which they derive. Geometric morphometrics, I'm arguing, is the systematic exploitation of a skill that we already have. 
this skill under constraint by scientific rules. It turns out you don't actually need the whole grid, you as the owner of a pair of eyes, binocular vision. Here, one of the classic pictures in animal locomotions from the work of Etienne Jules Marais about 150 years ago, a guy with a white line painted on one leg running. This is a, this is a negative, a stacked negative of his positions at several times. You see the dynamics very clearly but from the spacing of those lines in one dimension. Paul Clay, the artist, systematically experimented with this. Here's a picture called Wood Sprite, mostly one family of lines. And this is Wild Water. Yes, that protects, projects wonderfully. Um, the original is in black and white here. Um, likewise, only one set of lines in most of its parts. You don't need the other set of grid lines, usually. Um, this is the theater at the Roman ruin of Ephesus. You get its circularity or its, con con uh, its cone shape, mostly from the horizontal, in this view, grid lines. The others, the aisles of the theater, are extra. You didn't need them. And then um, the natural version of contour maps was invented about 3,000 years ago for riciculture in Asia. These are level lines of a surface whose geometry can be read quite accurately just from one set of the contours. You produce the orthogonals by yourself mentally. Uh, continuing with this little survey, this is a famous art photo of the steps of the cathedral at Wells, 1903, Evans. You see only the steps in this picture, but your mental interpretation matches this figure from the textbook by Kundering, solid shape. This is the representation of an asymptotic line where a surface deviates from visibility in your view. This picture has both grid lines. This picture has only one set, and they are obviously the same surface. So here I'm playing games with your visual system. So was Marcel Duchamp, new descending a staircase. All of the action is left to right, uh, with a little bit of descent involved. The vertical is unchanged, and you draw those grid lines automatically in your mind. Uh, or back to Paul Clay, who noticed, and we will use this a lot, that a grid transformation becomes much more a perceptual object if you draw something on it that is being deformed by the grid. And Clay also played games to smooth this line, to render it smoothly even though it should have been broken, and otherwise to make this visibly, visually more palatable. Well, uh, this isn't news to artists. Um, Diane Kirkpatrick, professor of history of art at the University of Michigan, pointed me to an example from 1593 when she heard a very early version of this talk. Uh, Heinrich Goltzius Pygmalion, the sculptor in Galatea, the, sculptor, the, the model he sculpts that comes to life. The grids that are used here for surface rendition convey 3D knowledge. And we'll be looking a little bit at this region and a little bit at this region, just off the picture, but also at this region, the nipple of the right breast, because that matches one of the technical drawings I'll be showing you in the exploration of the geometry of this in about 10 minutes. This is one of the partial warps of a set of five points. And again, here it is, clearly represented in terms of the curvature of these lines in a way that represents this clearly as a surface for you. Uh, here's another partial warp from another geometric morphometric setup. Um, a saddle point bending in opposite directions of surface curvature in its two principal directions. And here on the belly of the model is that same pattern of lightly bent lines. So clearly representing the saddle point where the positive curvature of the belly transitions to the milder curvature of the abdomen. So the artists 500 years ago knew how grids represent surfaces, independent of shading, and certainly independent of 3D perception. These are 2D published drawings. Eric Heckel, closer to this building, Art Forms in Nature, used grids systematically to represent surfaces of negative Gaussian curvature, saddle points, in this mostly imaginary structure 
when you look at it up close, you see that he has used the same graphic texture over and over to indicate what we would now call a mathematical model of a minimal surface. This doesn't always work. And part of the charm of things like op art is that they can't be represented as surfaces in many cases. Um, I think it's intentional, although I've never talked to the artists. These are fields that have curl in a mathematical sense or that otherwise will frustrate the viewer. I'll show you some more of these later on, but it's nice to see that, or it's nice to be reminded that you are not supposed to see those pictures as surfaces. These are examples of registration of multiple images of brains, slices of cortex. Those don't parse visually the way we have been examining them. Those are representations for computer use, not representations for communication with radiologists. They don't work that way. Uh, these are communications with humans. Again, they're not surfaces, they're just beautiful. I found these on the web. They're the work of Marius Vatz. I wonder where he is. We have a history of attaching representations of shape to multivariate statistics. Ironically, that history starts with Buxtein coordinates 40 years before I was born. Galton used these in 1907, and the custom in statistics is to name things for the second person who discovered them. <laughs> that is Stigler's law, and we don't know who discovered Stigler's law, but we do know it wasn't Stigler. Steven Stigler, professor of statistics at Chicago. Um, Galton suggested these in an article in Nature to be used by Scotland Yard to convey the profile of criminals from Scotland Yard to, say, Scotland, where they could be used to identify people. And these are classic two-point shape coordinates of the sort that I wrote an entire book about about 20 years ago. Galton says this is good enough to tell the difference among about 100 people. An even closer approximation of the biometric approach, the approach without pictures, comes from Carl Pearson, the same guy who invented correlations. In 1935, he was faced with examining this object. It's called the Wilkinson skull because it was owned by a family named Wilkinson. But it is a skull, a mummified skull, that has a post of wood through the bottom and a spike on the top. And it matched the description of what happened to Oliver Cromwell's head after he was um, disinterred, hanged, and beheaded in that order. And his skull was put on a fence outside of Parliament as a warning to others. It fell off in a thunderstorm about 100 years ago. And the question was whether this object, uh, which is a mummy that has a mustache and a beard and a wart socket here, was in fact the skull of Oliver Cromwell. Pearson measured landmark positions on that mummy, corrected for putting the flesh back on, and on a whole bunch of sculptures, solid sculptures of the face, including a death mask and several life masks, published superpositions like these, which we are saying that's pretty close, and then concluded that that mummy matched the average of all of the ratios of distances between such landmarks as the wart socket or the tip of the nose and that, to a moral certainty, this was the skull of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, enough people agreed that it's now buried in a secret place at Sussex College. So this is Pearson's published table of how the ratios match. If they had not matched, he would have gone on to invent geometric morphometrics, because he was a very good statistician, and I wouldn't be standing here before you today. I probably would not have had a job. The culmination of this tradition of putting down points and measuring things on them was the classic tradition in anthropometry. Uh, here's the cover of a, a second edition of a 1914 textbook that we still use with our students. It's in German. But it has drawings of, in 2D in this case, all the points that you would take from the lateral view of the skull, from the frontal view of the skull, from the mid-sagittal view of the skull. You saw those in my fourth slide. From, the, um, from that set of points, you define measures pretty much at your free will of the length of the skull, of the breadths of the skull on this basilar view, of the height of the skull, 
various measures of the height of the skull above the ear, of various angles that you can put on the skull. And in addition to the angles, you can put an essentially infinite number of distance measures. You're not supposed to read this slide. It's taken from 10 and a half pages of solid text, arbitrary ratios. When you count them all up for 68 points, there are about a million possible measures. And one way you can think of geometric morphometrics as getting away from the sheer arbitrariness of picking the points and picking the distances and picking the angles and picking the ratios in this setting. If you allow the field to set the conventions, then we still do this today. This color, fi color figure from a paper with my collaborator, Philip Gunz of Leipzig, shows a typical set of points in two dimensions, uh, both landmarks and semi-landmarks. We'll hear about those later. Some have names, some don't. Uh, and this matches the general approach that Martin was showing so long ago. This is from a contemporary paper, 2009, on facial growth. You see points, you see curves, you see angles, and you see a table of arbitrary measures with averages and standard deviations from multiple groups. Or straight from the computer, not even from publication, you have web services that will put down multiple x-rays of the head and pull out any angles you want, any ratios you want. The question is, how, you, how do you decide what you want? And the answer is going to come from the Venus of Willendorf, essentially. What you want is the descriptions that most characterize the differences from the average, from normal, from other forms you're comparing to. That point, that a method is needed to select the measures, was the subject of the paper that uh, of my early period. This is paper half a lifetime ago. I'm 64. This is 32 years old. Um, that took the longest to bring into practice. We said we need new cephalometrics, Robert Moyers and I, back in 79. And this problem finally got solved about 2006. Long time for a tool builder's delay. I first proposed in my dissertation a method by orthogonal grids that really actually had beautiful mathematics and failed because we can't read the grids. Um, this is a nice one, the growth of the gorilla. But when you do it more realistically, these grids that are constructed to be orthogonal in two forms, although they always exist, have mathematical features, these singularities, that distract you from the plain meaning of the, of the analysis. Namely, this growth is merely an intensification of this growth. We know it from the modern analyses. We cannot read it from that presentation in the late 1970s. Uh, less elegant and therefore less of a failure. Um, was my method of tensor biometrics about 1984, in which we triangulated the form and reported the findings of a jigsaw or um, similar assemblage of multiple triangles. This is a function of the triangles, as I discovered, and so did Jim Cheverud, who tried something quite similar. Where we finally ended up was an idea that um, came from the literature of computer graphics and image processing. It was the creation of this object as the mediator between two forms at the same time. The decision then is to measure the pair of forms, not either form separately, as the inheritor of the approach of the sculpture of Venus of Willendorf, who is sculpting a form that conveys a comparison. This is an interesting construction. And we'll talk about it for the rest of the talk today. It is our central subject because this grid formalism is at the same time a publication-ready picture. The picture I just showed you is from a paper. It's the exercise of a trainable, broadly human cognitive faculty that does not require a graduate degree. And it incorporates a segmentation process by which you can figure out how to talk about it. I'll be showing you how to intensify that intuition over one of my last dynamic sequences. It's a new diagram of an actual statistical method, a biometrical method. So those pictures come with standard errors and with significance tests if your editor insists that you use them. That is, a quanti that is an exactly quantitative representation. And 
it's consistent with E.O. Wilson's approach to a consilient biology. It's consistent with information from both holistic and reductionistic approaches. You can put lower level information onto those as maps. So the first thing I want to persuade you of is that you can read these. So here's the chairman of the University of Michigan Dance Department, Peter Sparling in 1977, wearing a costume with about 20 odd landmarks on it. And here's the frame I showed you before, um, a frame from later on in the movie that I'm going to be playing you a shorter clip from through a few loops. You can read that grid, and I'll show you, you can read it with or without his image on it. Um, so let me cut to that video. This is the square grid he started with. Um, and here is his form under that grid. But I'm going to put the grid back on and run this now, not on the video, but on the deformation of that original image. So here he goes, folding his arms. And uh, in every frame, he's in there. But I'm going to take him away. And you can just watch that image for a while. And you see it dancing, most people do, as if it's somehow an animated character in the movie Aladdin, as if this is a flying carpet that is communicating to you by its form changes. Each of those frames is at the same time a form and a comparison of forms. And you are following this quite smoothly at roughly three times original speed. Um, I'm playing this back to you fast because this is a one hour, 50 minute lecture instead of a semester course. You are having no trouble with that. In the dance concert this was part of, that was so compelling that when it was projected at the same time as Sparling was dancing, nobody was watching Sparling. We had to turn off the projection when he was dancing. That's a powerful appeal to a part of your cognitive system that you don't often use for science. The mathematical roots of that are quite recent. They're from oops, um, about 1975. Um, that will not be on the exam. Uh, and the irony of the title of the next piece, Multivariate Interpolation at Arbitrary Points Made Simple, will certainly not be on the exam. Um, this was not made simple, but I was lucky enough to find somebody that could explain it to me, David Rogozin at the University of Seattle, University of Washington, and published an article with that title in 1989 that's had more than 1,400 citations, which counts really as remarkably well-placed from the point of view of any built tool in biometrics. The mathematics of this isn't the subject of this lecture, and there won't be any formulas here, but you should know that that and every grid you're going to see is a superposition of things that look like this, that look really unpromising but are a mathematical miracle because they minimize the local bending of those grids. Anything you see in the grid is really there by theorem. They're just superpositions of this one form deformed into an ellipse and added together. So here's what that looks like. I'm on this frame now. Um, I'm going to start with something that doesn't cause you any trouble at all. Is that working? Yes. If I only have three points, you just count them, one, two, three, and I move one of them around, I just get the tumbling of a piece of graph paper in space. If I add a fourth point, you can see that. I can almost force you to see that as a warped surface. Um, if you can't, it might be that you don't have binocular vision, but almost every person with normal vision sees this as a surface that I'm pushing up or down. Of course I'm not. I'm dealing with a two-dimensional projection onto that screen. And if I take away the perspective cues from you, it's still the projection of a surface. Now, like that, one horizontal, or like that, another horizontal overriding itself, or like this. All of those now are deformations of a 2D image they were a 3D surface. They are now deformations of a 2D image. We go forward to a set of five points, and this, oops, missed it. This is obviously a surface. Turn off the forces. This is obviously a surface. Yes? Trampoline, right? Rather extreme. And in the plane, this is a surface that you're looking at from below, and this is a surface you're looking at from the, from the left. I'm giving you contradictory information about perspective, but either way, you're perfectly willing to see this as a hill, I think. At least my students all say that they can. 
And to go one more level here, let's just stop this at six points. If I do this as a surface, it's something like a tilting chimney, up and down. And if I do this in the plane, this is the same thing viewed from the front. And this, you don't really know what it is, do you? Until I turn that and view it from the correct direction, the direction that makes it a surface. And you can see that I'm putting in that same wave now at 90 degrees. So I'm intentionally abusing your visual system here and you're letting me. I can show you a 2D deformation and in many cases I can make you see it as a 3D surface and you see it clearly. Uh, that's it for that file. Back to the slides. Um, so here we were, the summary of that early part of the sequence. This is the four-point prototype. This is the five-point prototype. And the interesting thing about the five-point prototype is I can also screw you up on this. This is that surface pointing up, giving you a clear crease cue. This is the same surface rotated 180 degrees. It's now dented instead of with a hill. And these two you can't process because your surface processing software, wetware, is directional. You can do this to a horizontal crease and you can't do this to a vertical crease. It's hard to see the world in 3D when you're lying in bed, lying sideways. We do this with respect to a horizontal, another reason for suspecting its origin is evolutionary. The general spline, the thing we'll be seeing over and over in the rest of this lecture, comes from doing this twice at the same time in impossible perspective. The reports of these splines consist of simplifying the perspective until it is possible, of reducing a four-dimensional surface to a 3D one. Um, okay, this isn't projecting well, so I'm going to have to enlarge it, sorry. That's gonna work. There we go, it's a little better. Um, this kind of grid starts from this set of six points, a square and two others, and um, I'm sorry, I can't do that on my screen. And I have to take it down. You're going to have to believe me. There we go. What happened? Try 505. I'm sorry about that. Um, I have screwed myself up here. Excuse me a moment. There. Thank you. Sorry about that. The general form is the construction of one surface corresponding to the horizontal in the picture, coordinate that's red as a surface this way, and in impossible perspective, construction of a surface for the y coordinate in a different third dimension. We don't have a different third dimension. These are four dimensional pictures. The general transformation is the combination of those two and has to be viewed as if you are free to pick a perspective that makes sense. We saw this before in that your choice of perspective can be this horizontal or this horizontal or a horizontal in between. And we play with that according to the signal we're trying to see. Um, this isn't projecting as well as I'd like and I'm sorry. This is real data from a corpus callosum study of schizophrenia. To make that visible, we take it as a four-dimensional surface, take my word for it, and can tumble it until we get the best 3D possible view, which happens to be this frame down here, makes this view. I will show you later how to make that even clearer. It turns out to have two and only two features. Or the example that came earliest in the medical literature, this is a study of schizophrenia, doctors versus their patients. We ought to be able to tell the difference, not just by coat color. Uh, 13 landmarks from mid-sagittal CT, much worse data than we now use. Here are the landmarks. This is the finding. Um, that's just not very impressive, is it? You can see, if you're really careful, that the averages are in different places. You can't really see the arrows that make them look like they're shifting. You might be able to see a feature in this grid, even if, especially if it was projected a little better, but by using these manipulations, I can probably force you to see that there's only one feature. Making the change larger can help. You now see that as a rise, one of those tilted chimneys. 
that I showed you about 10 slides earlier. And it can be quantified by going backward, by saying how much do I have to go in the negative direction until it is zeroed out completely. That's too much and here's the right answer. Or for growing rats, these are sets of eight points on rats observed serially. Here's a transformation that clearly has something going on but is hard to read and would be hard to read even if you could see it clearly. Again, I apologize for the projection problem. Um, you tumble it in four dimensions until a clear signal comes out of one of the frames. It's this one. And that shows you more clearly one of the two features it has, this particular crease which in this case means the least growth is between that pair of landmarks. It's the interparietal suture. Wrong button, wrong place. There's also a large scale feature that you saw about 10 slides ago, that square to kite transform where I took four points and moved one of them up the diagonal. And that pair of features summarizes what that pair of average rat forms are doing. This can be made, is this the last one? No, it's this one. This can be made into a rather classy sort of algorithm um, just by moving transformations larger, extended and smaller until they just look like the best surfaces. And it's easiest if I take the landmarks off when I do that or if I go backward until they collapse in a crease like the one we saw underneath the breast. You can check that you've come to the crease because a piece of grid over here turns into a one-dimensional line over here. You have made the transformation collapse sum of space and that's the key to the report. The phenomenon is not that extreme. The phenomenon looks like that, but the key to the report is what was shown. Or we can take that example, the first one I gave you, we need to make that grid a little bigger. And by running this forward as a multiple, I can show you that it has two features. One over here at this, this left end, one over here, and nothing else is going on. I go forward on the map, here's that feature at the right end, and here's the feature at the left end. And if I move that back and forth, it behaves charmingly like an animated character. Um, the rat crease is the last of these examples. Looks, whoops. Um, looks like this. I make it bigger and track it. Wrong button. Wrong button. And there's the crease we were looking at. So you're not, your eye is now forced to see it or at least I'm forcing you to see it, because I've made it into a surface in 3D instead of 4D, and you know how to read that. So that was the crease demonstration. It turns out that every rat does the same thing. This is actually part of ratness. What we saw on the average is the case for each one, uh, which is nice to know about the rats. This approach, I'm claiming, replaces every superposition approach from Rudolf Martin up through the Procrustes methods that are the mathematics of this. Jim Rolfe explains this nicely when he says, the Procrustes statistics are a good way of doing your biometrics, and they are not a good way of showing your biometrics. They have the wrong pictures. This is data from Martin superimposed halfway between Bayesian and Nasion. That's misleading. This is misleading, superimposed on Sella from Joseph Biegert. This is misleading from three years ago in the Journal of Human Evolution, curvilinear paths in Procrustes space. And this is worse, showing some areas are added and some are subtracted in Procrustes space. And this is wrong from the time I was writing my thesis. Gelater and Fenar superimposing the growing head, gorilla head, on the semicircular canals. All of those are wrong in place of this drawing, the extended deformation grid, this is for growth of the human lateral cephalogram, the face is pointing down in this case, which shows you, because it can't help showing you, but show you where things are getting relatively smaller, that's in the brain, where they're getting larger in the maxilla, where the getting larger is directional, this is anatomical horizontal in the maxilla, and where these domains abut each other. These creases 
and segmentations and deformation grids convey the essence of the geometry of geometric morphometrics in a way that you already know how to process. When we add curves like these 20 odd completed drawings of heads, they're represented as separate points, as in this analysis over here. The colors, by the way, are arbitrary. You're not supposed to make any sense of them. When you do that, you can do it in 3D as well. This is a beautiful picture from Philip Gunz. We call these semi-landmarks, and they're points that typify extended regions of surface. They do not have individual names, and they nevertheless add to the statistics. There are lots of ways of defining these points. Jim does them by Procrustes distance. I do them by bending energy. The industry does it by elastic energy, as in fishnet hose. And you have no idea how hard it was to find a non-sexualized version <laughs> of fishnet hosiery. So this is, these are semi-landmarks. They're forms of a grid that are placed over a curving anatomical surface, and they are highly anisotropic. You can stretch them across the diagonals of those rhombuses much more easily than you can stretch the elements of those rhombuses. And they can fit anything. This is what I was mentioning to you earlier today, Jim, as yet another kind of semi-landmark. You can buy these for $3.95 um, at the local discount store. There's no mystery of what we're doing here in terms of the bending. The geometry all looks like putting a line, lean, leaning a line on a marble on a table. I make my graduate students explain this as part of their thesis defenses in Vienna, but it won't be part of today's lecture. But you need to see how well that can work from this part of this demo, which says if you have points that characterize a line like these two, you can simply drag them together by other landmark information in a way that forces the thin plate spline to be as little bent as it can to leave them on the line but drag along the line. Or an, our landmarks like that um, along a hint of a curve. I can digitize using other information that slides along that very coarsely digitized curve or a much more finely digitized curve. I'm accepting the information about the curve and denying any knowledge of position along it. That's semi-landmarks, a rather longish word for a simple concept. We're using the thin plate spline not just to show us what we want to see, but to conceal what we have decided to be forced to ignore. And the key to this technology is to let the algebra obey the desire to ignore something that we have decided in advance does not have meaning. Now, these analyses look very colorful, but the main function is to improve the pictures. On the left is a grid for the landmark points only. There are 20. On the right, sorry about that fact that it's hard to see, is the same analysis, normal growth, for the landmarks and the semi-landmarks, points like those. The grids are virtually the same. But the picture, believe it or not, is easier to see when you have the semi-landmarks. This is Paul Clay's point. It aids your vision. The semi-landmarks apply important additional information when you don't have these identifiable points. Um, for the corpus callosum of the brain in 3D, for instance. Um, we do a lot better by measuring the curve of the corpus callosum than by measuring any scalar aspects of it, length or curvature or height or uh, points around it. This is a nice correlation between its shape and fetal alcohol syndrome and two kinds of behavioral deficit, the one that doesn't matter, being clumsy, and the one that does matter, failure of executive function. We'll come back to that in a minute. 3D grids are hard to read, and what we usually use in 3D is a forced simplification into a surface that has the points, and curves on it. And instead of the curving surface itself, we represent it by a grid of semi-landmarks and then erase the original data and do the analysis only in terms of these separated points. And then we put the surface back on in 3D after all the analysis is done. Again, the algebra of the statistics is concealed from your eye, but the meaning of the statistics in terms of deformation is forced on your eye. Um, I want to close with three topics for the 
medium-term future. One has a technical name, space-time decorrelation. One is trying to reach out to another building, uh, bioengineering. And one is toward the reduction of human misery, a phrase from Bertrand Russell. There's a problem with the data for these studies in that everything is correlated, both in space as you go around and in time. These are growth series. And we need models that reflect that as a deviation from the null, that presume decorrelation, in particular in space. This is an example of one of those. And you have no idea how unusual a picture this is, because you are not wired to process it. The shape of every little square here is independent and has the same distribution of the shape of every other little square. Um, they're samples from the same distribution, regardless of the size of the square. It's hard to believe this exists, but it does. And here are nine more of them, all from the same model. So these are all meaningless deformations. You probably can't handle that. I couldn't. These are all null. They have no local information because they're from simulations that didn't. We need ways to tell that our data aren't this. And that's an easy, relative, quotes, easy. Uh, maximum likelihood sort of procedure. When you do it, it's a lot like fractal geometry in the world of deformation. Here, for instance, is the demonstration that that distribution does not fit our schizophrenia data. This is the grid you saw before, and this is the first principal component against that as a null model, causing, calling your attention to the same part of the picture. So we can now look for features at any scale in any direction, in an um, agnostic way. These somehow remind me of these pictures by Clay that, again, look like they're self-similar scaled. This is a representation of a city. This is a representation of farmland. Those are beautiful, and the detail comes similarly at all different levels. There's a transition to an area where biometrics can't be done. These are 26 different growth series for girls from the University of Michigan sample. They're magnified fivefold. And these look so different from each other that you probably shouldn't even average them, which is something that orthodontists learned the hard way. You can't really predict individual variations from craniofacial growth. When you take that a little more extremely, you get to the classic language of qualitative systematics. If you're doing botany, you don't usually measure the shape of leaves across the plant kingdom. There's too much variation. You just use words. And these methods do break down where variation is so extreme or so topological that you have to use words. The sculptors of the Venus de Milo, uh, Venus of Willendorf, didn't have to. The people in the cave paintings drew different species, but could use deformations for similar species. That was the first topic. The second topic is the connection with bioengineering. We can't model reality. This is what a beam does. When you put a load on one end of it, it bends this way. And if you try to show that in geometric morphometrics, instead you just get a trapezoid. I'm sorry, you can't see it, but it's just a trapezoid pointing down this way. Or if you try to force it, um, you get the wrong answer. You get the wrong answer from geometric morphometrics in lots of ways. At the same time, there are things that beams can't do, like uniform shears, that living forms like rat skulls can. The tie between engineering uses of the thin plate spline equation and morphometric uses of thin plate spline equation is a subject of great interest to me at the moment, and I'm trying to get funding for it. These two methods, the stress analysis of this building and those splines I've been showing you, are using the same equation from those original papers. Um, they're certainly using it differently, and we need to understand the data analysis. The third topic, the one I want to end with, is a most unexpected application. As Jim mentioned, I'm doing work in forensics, forensic psychiatry, actually. Um, I've been involved in about 15 death penalty cases where the convicted murderer has, it turns out, an alcoholic mother and can be shown to have brain damage of the fetal alcohol type, which mitigates the culpability for the crime. So those analyses look like this. We've got a murderer whose initials are not XX, the solid line. And we got a, a normal average 
this dashed line. And we have a thin plate spline between them. And my technique of exaggerating it, which shows you that his difference from the normal is concentrated right here where the spline collapses. That turns out to be a known region where these forms are unusually thin in persons with fetal alcohol damage. That then converts to a standard statistical plot. We have normals, the solid circles, and we have people with fetal alcohol syndrome, the pluses and x's, and we have our prisoner here who is completely surrounded by other fetal alcohol cases and is nowhere near the normals. You report this to the jury as odds of 800 to 1, that's what the computation tells you for this being a fetal alcohol damaged brain, and the jury in this case came back with a sentence of life instead of death. This is a little late in the life of people to find the da brain damage, and the study that I'm actually fondest of tries the same thing at birth using ultrasound instead of MRI. This is an image of a typical fetal al uh, alcohol exposed and apparently damaged newborn. Four landmarks on it, just four. They're actually semi-landmarks. Watch this one, because in the next plot, we'll see that of its 14 highest values in our sample, 13 correspond to the alcohol exposed kids. Those kids have evidently been damaged and I'm trying to get grant support to follow kids like that through life. This average picture looks different from that average picture. This is a character in biological language. Well, um, this comes to the end of the topics I wanted to touch on. Biology and mathematical imagination. We're using the classic comparative method. We're using images to compare two or more forms at the same time. And you were born, more or less, with this ability. It's parallel to statistics. It is not the same as statistics. It uses statistics as its content, but presents it to you as differently from tables of numbers as it can. We've come from the Venus of Willendorf here to this thin plate spline connecting two species. And we've had some digressions along the way, I guess, uh, dance concerts and your ability to process this picture. I am. Honored to be here, as I said, to be the first, the inaugural recipient of this medal, which we think conveys the emergence of morphometrics as a field in more than one country at the same time. I'm also lucky to be here, having been born early enough for computers to be powerful and late enough that this hadn't been done before. The, the take home message can be conveyed finally by this pair of images. This is a classic picture of German Romanticism. Der Wanderer über dem Mibelmeer. This is the statistician, right? He's sweating badly in his tailcoat. He's had a long climb to some point it's within about 100 miles of Vienna. And he's looking, trying to tell the difference between the signal, that's those mountains that are on his map, and the noise, the fog, that is our models for variation. The morphometrician is in a better position than the statistician. He also has some information about the geometry. Watch that mountain there. It turns into this mountain here. The morphometrician has information about curvature, about grids, about transformations. That's this little Tibetan peasant here. And so the morphometrician, morphometrician has a better idea of the map of the front of the path forward. That mountain, multi-level holistic reductionist understanding of biology is still a long way away. But geometric morphometrics is part of the biological toolkit, and it is a skill that the biologist had before he started school, he or she. You were born with it. Our species was born with it. And with that message and um, the thoughts it might invoke in you, um, I finish my formal comments. Thank you. Thank you.